In August and September 2022, Ukraine launched two counteroffensives. The first one in the southern region in the Kherson in Mykolaiv Oblast. The second one in the Kharkiv Oblast. Particularly the latter one was a major success. In a few days, the Ukrainians liberated about as much territory as Russia had captured in a few months. By causing the disintegration of Russian forces around Izium, Kubiansk and other logistically vital cities. From the outside, Ukraine appears to have changed the whole complexion of the war. This was even acknowledged by Russia. The Kremlin acknowledged its defeat in Kharkiv Oblast, the first time Moscow openly recognized the defeat since the start of the February 2022 invasion of Ukraine. Interestingly, the analyst Jack Watling notes that the Kharkiv offensive had the intent of severing the ground lines of communication to Izium and then by achieving two effects, firstly surrounding or cutting off Russian forces, which would create a time pressure for the Russians to recover those troops, that part of the plan didn't work, because the Russians withdrew during the offensive. Of course, other sources don't talk about a Russian withdrawal, but the route. So the question is, why did the Russian defenses not hold in the Kharkiv Oblast? Two warnings here. First, the recent developments of late September to early October are not covered in this video. Yet since we look almost exclusively at fundamental factors, nearly all points except one apply. Second, since this is an ongoing conflict and the counteroffensives aren't concluded yet, the source situation is not the best. It will also be interesting to see how the video stands the test of time. After all, the opinions vary quite widely, something discussed in this video on my second channel. Anyway, let us start at the top, or maybe the lack thereof, namely the unity of command. So what is unity of command? Well, one definition is unity of command, the operation of all forces under a single responsible commander who has the requisite authority to direct and employ those forces in pursuit of a common purpose. So in other words, you have one commander that directs the combined forces to achieve a unified strategy. This is crucial in various aspects like communication, allocation of resources, coordination and various other aspects. The question of who is the top field commander of the Russian armed forces in Ukraine came up several times. For instance, in March 2022, CNN did an article about it. To quote, the US has been unable to determine if, if Russia has designated a military commander responsible for the leading the country's war in Ukraine, according to multiple sources familiar with the matter. Something the current and former defense officials say is likely a key contributor to the apparent clumsiness and disorganization of the Russian assault. Former US General Mark Hurtling noted that as such a military commander and his staff would need to determine key requirements like forces, intelligence, logistics, analysis of terrain and weather, tasks for subordinate commanders, coordination of service commanders like air, navy, artillery, cyber, etc., and a lot more. Now, if there is no overall commander, this would mean that the commanders of the Russian combined arms armies would coordinate among themselves. Even assuming they would work together really well, it would still require them to do all the work for their area of responsibility and then the one above them for coordination. So it would be like having several orchestras, each with its own conductor, and those conductors directing their own orchestras while also coordinating with the other orchestras to play one symphony. Apparently, in April 2022, General Alexander Dornivkov was appointed the command in Ukraine, although it seems in June 2022 that he had been dismissed from his post. There are various indications that there is a lack of central direction of the Russian operations. To give one example, on 17 September, the Institute of Study of War noted the following. Russian forces continue to conduct meaningless offensive operations around Donetsk city and Bakhmut instead of focusing on defending against Ukrainian counteroffensives that continue to advance. This means the Russians are using up their few reserves for this operation instead of strengthening the defensive near the Oskil river in the Kharkiv Oblast to prevent the Ukrainian forces from crossing the river and strengthening their bridgeheads. Another aspect with the lack of unity command is of course the Russian paramilitary organization Wagner Group which are not part of the Russian armed forces and some suggest that they might fight their own war as well. Although some disagree here that Wagner is not that independent. 
The main directorate of the Russian General Chief of Staff, Spetsnaz, have also generated proxy forces through which they can conduct expeditionary operations. Most notably, perhaps, was the formation of the Wagner Regiment in 2014. Although the Wagner Group, as it became known, has been widely described as a mercenary organization, it is routinely accompanied by Spetsnaz officer from the main directorate of the Russian General Chief of Staff, who helped to coordinate its activities facilitate the support the group receives from the conventional Russian military in its operation in Libya and further afield. During the high point of the Russian operations in Syria and now Ukraine, Wagner Group and companies have been cut across to fall under the command of the conventional Russian military. Whatever position is correct here, either way, having an additional organization clearly doesn't make the situation less complicated. Next point is leadership, particularly officers. To quote Guau and Bartles, if the backbone of Western armies is their NCOs, then the backbone of the Russian army is the officer corps. Officers are the primary trainers, disciplinarians, and repositories for institutional knowledge in the Russian armed forces. They also note that the staffs are generally small in Russian units, as such officers lead more often. Yet this also means that they are more exposed in combat. As such, during combat operation, attrition sets in. Additionally, Ukraine has particularly aimed at killing Russian officers. As the fighting intensified, Ukrainian forces targeted Russian leadership, killing generals and colonels who would have been expected to rally the Russian forces. Furthermore, since Ukraine received long-range precision weapons like HIMARS from the West, they particularly target not only ammunition depots but also command and communication facilities with high precision strikes. As such, the losses among the Russian officer corps are likely to be substantial. Let us move to the next point, namely logistics. Logistics are crucial for sustaining the fighting capabilities of a deployed force. First, let us look at the bigger picture, namely the concept of interior lines and exterior lines of communication. So what is the difference? Well, Mark Hurtling showed a similar graphic to this to explain the major difference. I think you can see the point. If you're just listening, Ukraine's lines of communication are shorter than those of Russia due to geography and the disposition of forces. Second, there have been many reports that indicate the Russian armed forces are ill-equipped and badly supplied. In some cases, basic elements are not provided to soldiers. For instance, Russian soldiers preparing to be sent to fight in Ukraine are required to buy personal equipment at their own expense, according to several servicemen who spoke to the Moscow Times Russian service on condition of anonymity. Some of the items apparently not provided by the army included footwear, body armor, bandages, and tourniquets. The problem with such reports and videos on social media is that it's hard to tell if it's a singular case of a specific unit, if it affects a few units, some units, or nearly all of them. Keep also in mind that various Western personnel also purchased their own personal gear for Afghanistan, although very likely to a different extent. Yet back to Russia. Generally, there have been too many reports over the years to completely dismiss this as a rare instance. It also seems to be in line with what the analyst Stanimir Dobrev wrote several years ago and we discussed a few weeks ago. If this is not a rare occurrence and various reports indicate it is not, then it is likely also the case that very other major facilities and services are not working. This might also to a certain part explain why Ukraine could capture so many Russian vehicles in the offensives. According to some statements, they captured more vehicles than they lost. What is without doubt is that very high quality equipment was captured, namely the T-90M tank, the most modern variant of the T-90. This raises several questions, namely why did the Russian soldiers did not destroy them? Did they not care? Was the withdrawal that hasty? Was some of the equipment forgotten? Yet another question, particularly for non-operational equipment, is how long has it been left in depots and or repair facilities? It is without question that something went horribly wrong here and many points indicate that the logistical services were highly inadequate. Third, the Ukrainian armed forces also targeted infrastructure and key facilities that are crucial for logistics as well. Ukraine's armed forces employed HIMARS and other Western systems to attack Russian ground lines of communication in Kharkiv and Kherson oblasts setting conditions for the success of this operation. In short, the Russian logistical system was plagued with various fundamental problems, then it was overstretched for months and became target of regular attacks as well. 
Jack Watling notes that already in July 2022 the long-range strikes had severely degraded Russian combat capabilities. The question is if basic supplies like food, water and medicine were also affected and to what extent. That is particularly important when we talk about morale. But first, let us look at manpower. From the beginning it seems that the Ukrainians had a larger force than the Russians in the area of operations. Additionally, the Russian armed forces sustained heavy losses in the first six months of fighting that likely exceeded those of the Ukrainian forces. The recent defeats followed by the partial Russian mobilization ordered on 21st September 22 seem to confirm this. Furthermore, Russia also seems to have removed a large amount of its troops from its border to Finland and the Baltic states, according to an article from 28th September 2022. Of an original estimated 30,000 Russian troops that once faced the Baltic countries in southern Finland, as many as 80% of them have been diverted to Ukraine, according to three senior European defense officials in the region, leaving Russia with only a skeleton crew in what was once its densest concentration of military force facing NATO territory. Another aspect is the quality of reinforcements. Several analysts point out that Russian training is strongly based on units, yet if they are deployed at the front, they can't really train well. Meanwhile, Ukrainian personnel receive training in various countries, particularly in the United Kingdom. There are other instances at the point that there is a severe problem with Russian manpower. In the beginning of July 2022, reports first showed up that Russian paramilitary organizations had begun recruiting efforts in Russian prisons. Something covered in more detail on my second channel. Since then, various other reports and videos have showed up that seem to confirm this. Ultimately, on 21st September, 2022, President Putin issued a partial mobilization calling 300,000 men to arms. The manpower issue brings us to the next point, which is more about Ukraine. Ukraine likely was able to deceive the Russian leadership in redeploying some of its troops. The first counteroffensive started in August in Kherson, Mykolaiv Oblast. In September, the attack in the Kharkiv Oblast followed. Yet, Ukrainian leaders discussed the strikes in the south much more ostensibly, however successfully confusing the Russians about their intentions in the Kharkiv Oblast. At the beginning of the first offensive there were also reports that noted that Ukraine had limited itself to one offensive, with small objective instead of two originally intended. This likely was a ruse that paid off. The Ukrainians publicly messaged the offensive against Kherson in the south. This caused the Russians to redeploy the VDV, their paratroopers, onto that axis, because the Russians recognized that this was an axis where it was politically very important. They held Kazan as the only real city that they obtained intact. And they also knew that it was on the west side of the Dnyopa river and therefore very vulnerable. Of course, the question remains if this redeployment would have happened anyway. The other issue here are likely the lack of operational security on the Russian side as well as the ability to detect the Ukrainian crude movements in time and or know of their upcoming plans. Which brings us to intelligence, or probably the lack of proper counterintelligence. The main problem here is that, well, intelligence is a secretive business, so we have to take everything with a bit more grain of salt than usual. Various sources note that the US has provided Ukraine with important information from satellite imagery, spy planes and other sources. Some sources noted that such information was only used to target Russian generals. As such, it can be assumed that Ukraine was provided with information on Russian defenses, troop movements and key facilities in the Kharkiv Oblast and beyond. This likely means that the Ukrainian leadership had at least rudimentary knowledge about the state of the Russian defenses and capabilities in the areas they attacked. Furthermore, the access of Ukraine to some US intelligence allows it to focus its own intelligence assets. Although some people think intelligence wins wars, this is not the case. Intelligence can tell you where the best spot is to put a nail into the coffin of your enemy. But you still need a hammer to drive in that nail. And that hammer are your armed forces. Another point is corruption in the Russian armed forces. In this case I will spare the specifics but some more general points via quotes from Lester Grouse and Charles Bartlett's book The Russian Way of War denote the following. Due to the Russian Federation's Tsarist Soviet past, Russia and by inheritance the Russian military has developed a nuanced view towards corruption, which makes its eradication difficult. Crimes of theft against individuals are viewed as in the West, but crimes of theft against the state are seen as much more 
tolerable. The rule of law in Russia follows quite a different way than in the West. According to one article from a professor of law in political science, the Russian citizens are rather passive when it comes to the corruption within the state. Thanks to Ryan for pointing me to this source. Yet there might be even more to it. Corruption in some cases might be even encouraged to have a leverage against certain people. Corruption is structurally encouraged by the Kremlin so that the civilian authorities have the threat of legal action against military commanders. This brings us to the final point, namely morale. Let us look at some basic facts. First, for Russia so far, the invasion of Ukraine was a special operation. Whereas for Ukraine, it is a fight for its existence. Second, everything indicates that the Russian operation should have been finished in a few days or maybe weeks. Yet, after more than six months, Russia was stuck. Third, at the beginning of the conflict, Russia clearly had better and more heavy equipment than Ukraine, particularly tanks and artillery. Fourth, Russia without doubt sustained severe losses in material. Fifth, Ukraine became and is heavily supported by Western weaponry. Sometimes even high-quality weapons like Enlaws, Javelins, HIMARS, and the Panzerblitz 2000. Some of these, like HIMARS, are also discussed in Russian state media, so this is not a secret. Adding to these points, the previous points, particular leadership, manpower, and logistics situation, it is highly unlikely that Russian troops in Orwell have particularly high morale. Quite on the contrary, anything indicates that the morale is rather low. Of course, there are likely differences, since the forces Russia deployed in combat are quite diverse as well. A mixture of elite soldiers, recent recruits and lightly armed and sometimes conscripted separatists who are often reluctant to fight outside their home provinces of Donetsk and Luhansk, many of whom are exhausted, having fought constantly without rotation for six plus months. Now, a force with low morale will fight less effectively. This is particularly an issue in withdrawal, since a withdrawal can easily turn into a rout. And as such, the front can collapse. This would also explain why so many Russian equipment was captured by the Ukrainian troops. The other explanation could be that the lines were just that thin and maintenance troops generally don't put up a fight if it's avoidable unless they are very highly motivated. To summarize, the Russian armed forces in Ukraine suffered from various problems, ranging from a lack of unity of command, depletion of the officer corps, and problems with intelligence at the top level. On the bottom level on which the army rests, there are various problems like logistics and manpower. Add to this decades of corruption and the result is a force with low morale. To the vast area to cover and the limited number of forces, there will be weaknesses in the lines. Something which can be exploited, particularly by a force that is able to conduct proper recon and or is provided with good intelligence. I hope you learned something new. Big thank you to Andrew for viewing the script and providing very valuable feedback. Special thanks to all my supporters for making trips to museums and to military archives possible. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.